Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday webinar series, although this month it's our Friday webinar series, Lunch with the Birds. Um, my name is Amanda Duren, and I'm the Program Coordinator for the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative. It's great to see some uh, familiar faces or familiar names, I should say, on the attendee list today. So thank you um, for joining us again. And for some of the new folks that are joining us today, welcome. And I hope you enjoy the presentation. Um, before we get started, I wanted to invite all of you to join us for our next webinar, which will be on the um, next month, of course, is the 100-year anniversary of the extinction of the passenger pigeon. So John Windau will be giving a presentation on, um, on that event. So definitely um, take a look at our website, and um, there will be registration open in just a week or so um, for that webinar. I also would like to announce some other upcoming webinar topics that we have planned. Um, bird Feeding in Your Yard um, by Tom Sheely from the Wild Birds Unlimited store here in Columbus, Ohio. And we'll also be um, welcoming um, a uh, bird bander who will be discussing saw wet owl banding here in Ohio. So definitely stay tuned to the website and um, hopefully you can join us for some of our upcoming webinars as well. For those of you that are new um, to the Wednesday webinar series, Lunch with the Birds, um, I would like to let you know that all of our webinars are recorded and archived on our site and um, posted to our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash obci1. And if you visit that site, you can see all of our past webinars and watch videos on some of the topics um, that you may have missed. And um, if you enjoy today's webinar, you can share it with your friends. Um, the video from today should be posted um, by about mid next week. So that brings us to our presenter today, Scott Allball. Scott is a faculty instructor and program coordinator for the Parks, Recreation, and Wildlife program at Zane State College. He completed his master's degree in biological science at Marshall University in 2008. Scott has been birding since age 16. He has led field trips and bird walks around Ohio for many years. Scott found common ravens in Jefferson County in January of 2006. And this discovery later led to the first confirmation of nesting ravens in Ohio in over 100 years. Scott has been involved in numerous birding organizations over the years, um, including the Brooks Bird Club, the Greater Mohegan Audubon Society, the Ohio Ornithological Society, and the recently formed Muskingum Valley Birders Club. So with that, I'm going to unmute Scott and um, bring up your presentation. All right, are you there, hey. Scott? I'm here, yeah. Thanks, Amanda, for that um, uh, introduction. And I'd like to welcome everybody. Thanks for indulging me here on a Friday. I understand that they're normally on Wednesdays, but I, I appreciate the, the schedule change. Um, so Before you get started, Scott, I'm sorry, I just wanted to um, mention to everyone, if you have any questions throughout Scott's presentation, feel free to enter them in the chat box. And I'll either uh, break in, Scott, and, and let you know about the questions, or we'll hold them to the end. Um, depending. Okay? Sounds great. All right. All right. Thank you. Thanks. So we're going to talk about fall warblers. And um, I want to give you a little bit of background on why I created this PowerPoint and this program. Um, as, a, as a faculty at a community college, one of my jobs is to figure out ways to take information and make it palatable for people so they can understand it. And we teach wildlife, which it tends to be a fun thing to learn, um, but also it can contain a lot of information all at once. You know, something like teaching birds or teaching uh, botany or fish, there's a lot involved. So how do you take chunks of information, break them down so that they are easily understood and easily digested? And so with that in mind, I was thinking about fall warblers, which tend to be somewhat of a daunting idea for a lot of us. Um, they're, they're not as easy as spring warblers. In the spring, you know, we've, we've been to McGee Marsh or to the Metro Parks or, or some place where we've seen spring warblers, and you know, they're not that difficult to learn. They all look different. They all sound different. Um, but in the fall, things are different. They, they become more enigmatic, and they still zip around, they still have all their energy. Um, they're a little more quiet, but they're different. So how do we take these, this group of 30-some species of birds and break them down into a, a 
method that we can use to identify them. So the, the, what you're about to see on these slides is basically something out of my own brain. It's not something that, that I got from a book or anything, but it's sort of, it makes sense to me. And you know, I don't, don't worry if it doesn't make sense to you. It doesn't hurt my feelings at all, but I understand that we all think of things in different ways, but this makes sense to me. And you may tweak this a little bit and say, okay, well, I'm, I want to reorganize, and then this makes more sense to, to you as an individual, and that's perfectly cool. Um, another thing I want to say is that this presentation is sort of um, developed around the state of Ohio and, and our, our warblers that pass through Ohio. And, and I look down through the, the list of participants, and I see there's some people from a couple of other states. Um, this is basically can apply to anything in the Midwest. The, the birds are going to look the same. Um, the only difference will be some of the timing. Um, if you live farther north or farther south in Ohio, I have peak periods of passage through Ohio. Uh, your state may be a little different, maybe a little earlier or later, but as far as the identification tips, that's going to carry over um, anywhere really in, in eastern uh, North America. So um, with that, let's, let's begin our presentation. And uh, what, is, what is the big deal? Uh, well, these things don't look the same as they did in May. Well, we saw them just a few short months ago, and now they're coming back through, and they look different. Um, they're not making any sound. They're not singing. If you learn the sounds of birds in the spring, you know the the, the black-throated greens are are singing high in the trees, and in, in the parulas are singing and you can identify these by their sound but now there's not so much and maybe even not at all um, not, not any sounds at all another thing that we have to contend with this time of year are the juveniles the birds have done what they're here to do and when they come to North America from the tropics they're here to breed and they have they've have achieved that goal hopefully and they have the juveniles that are that are now mixed in with all the adults, and that throws us another curveball. A lot of them are the same color as the leaves. Remember, in early May, maybe the foliage hasn't come out quite full yet, depending upon where you are um, geographically. But by August, yeah, our, these leaves are are on, and they're going to stick around for another well, another month and a half or so before they fall off. Um, so we have leaves to contend with, and a lot of these birds are the same color as the leaves. They're some sort of an, a greenish olive green. They're still just as active, though. They're still flying around, not sitting still, um, on the move, chasing each other around. And then don't forget warbler neck. Yeah, you know, you just probably recovered from it after spending all the time at, at Lake Erie at McGee Marsh. Uh, you got a crick in your neck, you've been to the chiropractor, you're feeling better now, and now it's time to start looking up in the air again. Um, so all these things coupled together makes makes it a little frustrating, and that's understandable. Uh, if you notice the, the picture I there with the confusing fall warblers, it's out of the Peterson Guide. Um, when you look at that picture on that, that page of the book, and you think, wow, this, they're all yellow and green. Um, I think that picture is a little too intimidating because it puts them all together, all in one spot, and you, it becomes a blur of yellow and green. But it's really not that bad. It's really not that bad when you, when you break it down. And that's the point of what we're doing here is breaking these down. So there's only a few species of our eastern warblers that are going to look drastically different in the fall as compared to what they look like in the spring. A lot of the birds, which you'll see coming up here in a few slides, a lot of these birds look almost exactly the same. And so that's not, not a real issue. If you know what they look like in the spring, you'll be able to identify them in the fall. Even though they're not singing, the birds are still making chip notes. They're still chipping from you know here and there, and you can use those sounds, just like it's just like birding in the winter. You know, you use these little sounds of chip notes, maybe chickadees and titmice, to help you locate where the birds are. You can do that with fall warblers. You may not know it's a warbler chipping, but you hear a chip note, you investigate and find out. Oh yeah, that's uh, that's a fall warbler, and they're and they're still zipping around. 
So where are the birds moving? That movement catches my eye. Um, and then don't forget to protect your joints. Do a few neck stretches. Uh, we don't want warbler neck going into the winter. So let's break it down into three sort of my my little um, brain child here as far as how can we take fall warblers and break them down in a way that, that is a little more palatable. So I said, okay, there's a bunch that basically look the same in the fall as they do in the spring. And we'll run through that list. There are a bunch that retain some of the important field marks and look only slightly different. And then there are some that look totally different. The ones that, you know, they, they really could blow your mind as to how different they are. So we're going to break it down into those three categories. And we will, um, well, let's address this first. When do we look for fall warblers? You know, this, is, this may vary geographically, but in Ohio, many of our nesting warblers begin to leave in late July and August. Uh, yellow warbler, for example, they do their thing. If they have a successful brood, they might start at least moving around and then maybe even heading out uh, as early as late July and then into August. Now, that doesn't mean all of the yellow warblers are gone by August. There's still some around. There may even still be some breeding yellow warblers in August. I worked several years ago on the Ohio Breeding Bird Atlas, and even in August I would occasionally, not often, but occasionally find a yellow warbler carrying food or still singing on territory. Um, but they're starting to trickle out. Some of our northern arrivals arrive, come as early as mid-August. Right about now, we're getting some of our northern uh, warblers. And then you're looking at them leaving around mid-October, maybe late October. So, you know, we've got almost a good two months of fall warblers in which we can practice and, and learn these birds. Okay, so for the warblers that look the same, I broke this down into 15 species, and some of these are, you're going to look at this list and say, oh yeah, I can, I can easily see this. An oven bird is an oven bird is an oven bird is an oven bird. And it doesn't matter if it's October or if it's April, if you're in Costa Rica or if you're in New Brunswick, oven birds look the same. And they don't really change you know, if it's an adult. Um, the water thrushes, Louisiana northern water thrushes. Those guys look the same. When you see one in the fall, it looks the same as it did in the spring. Worm-eating warblers, same with those. Yellow-breasted chats. Yellow-throated warblers, at least the adults. Now, keep in mind, and I'll talk a little bit about this, especially here later on in the PowerPoint, but um, you do have some juveniles. And in some cases, the juveniles look extremely similar to the adults. In some cases, they look drastically different. Um, but this list, think adult warblers when you see this list. They're going to look about the same unless you have a juvenile. Black and white warblers, black-throated blues, American red starts, the yellows, the prothonotaries, the Canada's blue wings, hooded's, and Kentuckys. When you see those adult birds in the fall, they look the same. Now with uh, the ones that breed here, so breed here is in Ohio and or Midwest, Kentucky's hoodeds, blue wings, red starts. You do have the juvenile birds to contend with, and you may even see those in July. So if you're out actively birding in the summertime, you may run into some of these juveniles and, and learn a juvenile hooded warbler as to what it looks like. You could learn that in July, maybe not in September when they're migrating. So these birds basically look the same. Now there's some tricky ones, and, and this is where Studying your field guide really helps. Uh, the black-throated blue warbler. That male looks the same spring and fall, but so does the female spring and fall. So some of these birds, you know, you've got different plumages. It's sexual dimorphism, we would say in science, where you have different plumages between the sexes. Um, so the female black-throated blue is on the right side of your screen. Uh, she looks drastically different than the male black-throated blue. So there's some tricky things. And this, you learn this kind of stuff by studying your field guides. And my advice to students who take ornithology is always, you see the bird in the field, identify it, go home at night, open your field guide, read everything your field guide says, look at the pictures, 
and get a handle on differences in sexes and ages and, and whatever your field guide shows you. Now there are some warblers that look slightly different. Um, we're looking at 16 species here. Once again, this is my my sort of my opinion, I, my educated opinion, I guess, just from watching birds for many years. The black-throated greens, black burnings, mornings, Connecticut's, golden wings, Nashville's, common yellow throats. These are all birds that will look slightly different when you see them. The perulas, Wilson's warbler, pines, palms, prairies, Tennessee, orange crown, Cape May, cerulean. And I usually have pictures of all of these. We're going to go through these one by one. <clears throat> Excuse me, starting with black throated green. Black throated greens are coming through around mid September through early October. So here in late August, um, we're maybe a little bit early for black throated greens, at least in Ohio. On the bottom left, you see your spring male black throated green. And you can picture that if you've seen those before. Imagine them singing in the trees. Um, you find the, the bird, he's got that gleaming bright cheek in the fall not singing and not as striking not the, you know, the whole black throat is missing however his he's still retaining some of those really crucial field marks such as the wing bars we've got one really nice wing bar that's lower and then kind of a partial wing bar on top and that bright yellow face still present so black-throated green warbler retains that bright yellow face, and you can use that as a clue to identify this bird in the fall. The black Burnian warbler, lower left, you have the spring male, and maybe you've seen these so bright that they're almost glowing. This is, this is one of my favorite warblers, just because of the, the strikingness of their color and the pattern that they have with that huge white splotch two wing bars sort of morphed into one there. Um, top right, we have our fall bird. And look, it's it's got the same basic pattern. Even though the colors aren't as showy, the colors aren't as striking, the pattern is there. The There's white on the wings. It's, it's kind of broken up into two wing bars. There's a yellow throat and a grayish face instead of bright orange and black. The pattern is there. And this, this brings up another, another thought that I have, and one of the things I tell students is don't pay so much attention to color. Color can sometimes get you in trouble. Color can um, change depending upon the angle of the light and, and the, the feathers of the bird. Um, colors may look different in dim lights compared to bright lights. But learn to recognize patterns, behaviors, and those things will take you a little bit farther on understanding your birds than will color. The morning warbler. On the left, you see the spring male. And on the right, you see a first fall. So um, I picked this picture specifically because it has the information on the bottom. This is in um, Colorado. A first fall morning warbler. Um, now in Ohio, they're coming through late August through mid-September, so you might start seeing some morning warblers. Hopefully, it's a cool bird if you do see it. But um, man, this is going to be one of the ones that if you see this first fall bird, you're going to say, wow, what was that little olivey yellowish thing that just skulked through the brush real low? Um, you know, it doesn't look like a whole heck of a lot. So we know or we can learn a little bit about their behavior and their behavior is morning warblers tend to be skulkers. They like to be low on the ground or near the ground, uh, low in the shrubs and they kind of move through quietly. So that's going to be the behavior that you see within this species. It's got a partial eye ring. Notice how the eye ring has a, it's kind of grayed out in the front and the back. Um, but you can see the eye ring on top and bottom. And there's a hint, just a hint of somewhat of a necklace or that bib that the, the adult birds have, um, which you may or may not be able to see depending upon angle and, and stuff. So this would be a tough bird to ID in the field in the fall. Um, that, could, that could possibly get you, if you get one of these first 
fall birds. Now, the adult birds, if you see an adult male morning warbler in the fall, he's going to look very similar to the picture you see on the left. But the juvenile would be a toughie. Here's one that um, might throw you off a little bit. The, the Nashville warbler, we have our breeding male lower left. And then we have our fall bird on the right. Um, these pictures are kind of cool because it's almost the exact same posture and position. Um, the bird on the right, it's just more washed out. More washed out. It still has a yellow throat. It still has some gray on the head. It, it has a full ring bar, or uh, eye ring, I mean. It has a full eye ring. Um, so it's just kind of a washed out adult. And you might say, well, okay, that... You know, how do I know that from, say, the morning warbler? Because it's, it's real washed out, too, kind of with an eye ring. What are you thinking as far as the difference? Well, what's the difference in behavior? Morning warbler is skulking low to the ground in the shrubs. Nashville, most likely going to be flitting around a lot higher in the trees. So you can go off of behavior to help you whittle these things down. Our Connecticut warbler. Um, the the best look I've ever gotten at a Connecticut warbler in bright, bright, bold colors was in the fall. So this picture on the lower left, I saw a Connecticut warbler several years ago that looked like that. It was stunning. And it was in the fall. So these fall birds of the Connecticut's will look very similar to what they do in the spring. But once again, these young ones coming through, see on the right, he looks a heck of a lot like that morning. Um, one tiny difference, check out that eye ring. So this guy this morning's got a little bit of a, the eye ring's kind of blurred out or disconnected in the front and back, whereas the Connecticut has a very obvious, very bold, complete eye ring. And in the case of these two birds, their behavior is going to be very similar. So these two are juvenile morning in a juvenile Connecticut, those would be difficult ones to see or to identify. They're tough to see too, but they're also tough to identify, whereas the adults look very similar. Here's our golden-winged warbler passing through Ohio and parts of the Midwest in late August to mid-September. Golden wings, um, we can see them in the fall, like the picture on the lower left that look just like they do in the spring. Um, but sometimes you're going to have your females and your young birds that look like the picture on the right. Same pattern. Colors are much more muted, much more dull. So once again, colors can trick you. Patterns, however, can be a lot more reliable. Common yellowthroat is a bird. It's probably one of our most common warblers in Ohio. breeds throughout the state. And um, the males, which you see on the left, look the same, uh, spring and fall. Well, male common yellow throat is male common yellow throat. But if you look at that picture on the right, that's a juvenile common yellow throat. And um, this, this is one that I can, I can almost remember the, the time and place where this bird was throwing me off, where I'm seeing this bird hopping around. It's just a little greenish gray ball and um, it took me a while before I realized that, you know, it, it really does have somewhat of a yellower throat. And then I put together, oh, you know, I'm standing in really perfect habitat for common yellow throat. And then I saw a male common yellow throat, and it's, it kind of came to me. Well, that and coupled with, and check out this picture, the posture. And that's really classic common yellow throat posture with that back being almost horizontal as he's walking across the branch. And I'm thinking, these are juvenile common yellow throats. You, know, you will see these things in, in July, maybe even in late June if they, if they have a good year. Um, so the, the young one might throw you off, but he's still got that little tinge of buttery yellow on the throat. The rest of him is uh, olive green. And another lesson is learn these birds' habitats. Learn their postures. You can use those things as clues to identify them with accuracy. The northern perula, late August through September, this is a bird that nests, um, is much more commonly nesting in Ohio 
now than it has been in the past several decades. But um, Northern Pula, basically the same. Just check out the bird on the lower left. That's our spring male. And on the right, we have our fall bird, a little more washed out. Still has that bluish gray tinge to the back and that olive green saddle, which if you know anything about this bird, it's, uh, it's often really high in a tree and can be hard to see. Um, so you don't always see that olive green saddle. Um, a little bit of an eye ring, but not much. And you may say, okay, what is the difference between this and if I were to see um, the Nashville? So here's our Nashville. Buttery yellow throat. Notice the Nashville's eye ring. And notice the, the distinction between the throat and the gray on the head of the Nashville. Now let's go back to Pula. Not as much of an eye ring. Still kind of has that distinction, but Perula is sometimes their throats are maybe a little bit more yellow, and the gray of the head isn't quite as gray. It maybe has a little tinge of blue to it. You won't always see the green saddle on the back. If you do, then you clinch it. Yeah, that's a Perula. Um, but if you don't, you might have to use some other clues. Perulas are also extremely small, like Nashville's, um, but I think Perulas are just a tiny bit smaller than the Nashville. Um, but the eye ring's going to be what gets you on that one. Wilson's warbler, you have your spring male on the left, and on the right it's a, a young fall bird. And um, this bird looks the, the same, except for the little cap. Take the cap off and you have your young bird. So that yellowish on the face, especially above the eye, that is going to stay. That's going to be a constant with this species. So you end up seeing a, a gray-green bird um, with no black on its head, but that yellow, we call it a supercilium, that yellow mark above the eye, that yellow supercilium. And it looks like a Wilson's, and it's shaped like a Wilson's, but doesn't have the black cap. Well, it's a Wilson's. And, and we'll be looking for Wilson's to pass through Ohio early to mid-September. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what other people's experiences are with this species, but personally, I don't see a lot of these in the fall. They seem to be more of a spring bird, but I, it might just be my experience. Um, maybe I just miss them. Pine warblers. This is, this is an unusual one, too. Pine warblers coming through late August to mid-October. This species can, you'll see pine warblers in the fall that will look just like the picture on the lower left. And they look the exact same as they do in the spring. Some of the young pine warblers, check out the picture on the lower right. Almost gray. They can be any variation among these birds, um, from bright yellow to washed out yellow, to gray. Um, what is the constant? The constant is the shape, the size and shape of the beak, the wing bars. Um, I, was gonna, I was thinking maybe the, the habitat, which is, you know, which is a good clue, but also keep in mind that sometimes in migration, um, birds will go to where the food is and maybe stay away from their normal habitat. But, Pine warblers, from my experience, uh, are pretty reliable in the pines, um, although not always. So they can be really gray. But if you see these birds enough, if you study your field guides enough, you'll get to a place where you can, you can say, OK, that picture on the lower left, I see that. Man, if I can paint it yellow in my mind, it looks just like a pine warbler. And, that's the, and if you can do that, make that connection, you can identify that bird. Palm warblers, they're washed out in the fall. Once again, lower left, we have our spring bird. And, and on the right, we have our fall bird. Washed out, but there's other clues and other constants. Palm warblers have a habit of bobbing their tails. They're a tail bobber. They like open areas. I've seen them in my yard before in the grass. Um, habitat can sometimes be a clue with palm warblers. You know, even if they don't have that rusty brown cap, the palm warbler is hopping along, bobbing his tail, shaped like a palm warbler, 
the body color hasn't changed much, and he's got a little brush of buttery yellow on the undertail coverts. And we'll be looking for palms mid-September through early October. Prairie warbler is a, this is a bird that breeds more commonly in southern Ohio than in northern parts of the state, but it's it's heading out by um, late August and September, so they're leaving our area and moving south. A lot of the adult male prairie warblers will look just like the picture in the lower left. And the juvenile prairie warblers, this is kind of an uninteresting one here in the picture on the right. The colors are, are um, the patterns are there, but the colors are different. So check out how the adult prairie warbler has a black line through the eye and that dark mustache mark that comes down and underneath the eye. Between that mustache and the eye is bright yellow, and then the supercilium is bright yellow. Well, on the juvenile prairie, it's a, it's a sh fuzzy shaded gray as far as the mustache and the eye line, and it, instead of yellow, it's a, more of a light whitish gray, which is below the eye and right above the eye. Wing bars, present, but much more muted and subdued. So the bird really looks almost the same, except for the colors are so much more subdued. The patterns, however, are still there. And if you learn its habitat, prey warblers like, they really like ecotones between or, or edges between woods and fields. So you're you're in a field, there's a woodland nearby, or maybe some scrubby vegetation leading to a woodland. You're on that edge, that's where the prairie warblers like to hang out. So that's another clue, that habitat clue, that can help you identify a prairie warbler in the fall. Tennessee warblers look very similar. Lower left is our uh, spring Tennessee. Upper right is our fall. Their heads get a little more yellow than compared to that grayish that you see in the spring. So in the fall, the Tennessee warbler's head tends to be a little bit more yellow. The young ones will look olivey all over. Um, shape and size is the same. But one of the really key features on this bird, and I'm pointing this out because in the next slide you'll see another species that's very similar, and these two are easily confused. Check out the undertail coverts which are the feathers right underneath the tail. And if you look at the two pictures on the right, I selected those pictures because they both show it's a white undertail covert. That's important when identifying the Tennessee warbler. Also, if you're saying, okay, so I see the white undertail coverts, but I'm still not getting the whole Tennessee warbler thing. Um, there's a little bit of a faint smudge of an eye line that's going to tell you it's Tennessee warbler. And also, the beak is very diminutive. Uh, it's got a small beak, very dainty looking beak for the size of the bird. Those are all keys for Tennessee. Now I'm gonna go to the next, the next one. This is an orange crown. Now check out this picture on the lower left and the picture on the, on the right. Lower left, we've got our spring bird. The right, we've got sort of a, a fall, summerish type bird. The orange crown doesn't change a whole lot, but it looks a whole heck of a lot like a Tennessee. So if I switch back and forth, man, these two are just little olive green balls. Um, they're not skulkers. So you're not going to find them down low like Connecticut's and Mornings. They're a different shape and size between Connecticut's and Mornings as well. Um, but they really do look similar, except... Check out the undertail coverts. And once again, the picture on the right, the reason I selected that is because you can see those undertail coverts. See, they're a tinge of yellow. So you have a tinge of yellow on the undertail coverts of the orange crowned, and you have white undertail coverts on the Tennessee. So these birds are they're, they're related birds. They act very similarly. They forage similarly, and they look a lot alike, except for those undertail coverts. So use that as a really strong clue to differentiate orange crowned from Tennessee. Cape May, you can see Cape Mays in the fall that look almost exactly like they do in the spring. They've got that yellow nape, which is the back of the neck. 
They've got that chestnut cheek patch, streaks, the yellow rump. I've seen them in the fall, and they're, you know, they're, yeah, they basically look like spring birds. But Cape Mays can be tricky, too. Um, and Cape May is, is Cape May reminds me a lot of the pine warbler, where you have this um, this pattern of uh, dullness, basically. So it goes from the bright uh, bright males all the way down through all these different um, gradients of gray to where you have one like the first fall that's pictured there on the lower right, where the thing's just gray with some gray streaks. Kind of a, a incomplete eye ring, which doesn't really show on an adult that much. Um, the one above it looks a little more like a Cape May. I can kind of see some of the yellow on the face, some of the pattern. It's showing me some of that stuff. But that one on the bottom, these can be real tough. And um, on occasion, I've seen or heard of, maybe not seen myself, but I've heard of Cape May warblers that will show up at feeders. Uh, maybe late in the fall or even early in the winter. And um, they tend to be these first falls that are really, really washed out gray and tough to identify. So this is one that I think um, my advice to you is going to be to go out and watch birds. Um, that's a, You want to be a better birder, go watch birds. But um, see some Cape Mays. You know, hopefully you can get out and see some of these birds and really differentiate uh, and see enough that you can say, okay, I can see this this color gradient as it goes into or from the bright to the gray of the Cape May. So this one's going to take some experience to learn. Cerulean warblers, I don't know where they go after they breed. Um, I don't I don't know if you know, who knows this information, but they sort of breed and then bug out. And and um, I know from my personal experience. I just, uh, you know, after like June-ish, I don't see them. I'm not sure where they go. Um, so they're just not very very commonly detected after they breed. Um, let's see, you've got the male on the lower left and then your female on the right. And um, they're going to look very similar to that if you happen to do, um, do see one in the fall. So that leaves us with the, our last five species. Um, there's only five. I mean, we just went through a ton of warblers that have very similar features spring to fall, excluding some of those juveniles. But here's the five species that are really going to look different, that really go through some either some drastic molts or have some drastic changes between the sexes and, and the, I mean, the juveniles. So the chestnut-sided, the yellow-rumped, the magnolia, bay-breasted, and black pole. These are the ones that when, when that Peterson book where he shows you the confusing fall warblers, uh, he could have just put these five species up there because these are the ones that I think are really confusing. Starting with chestnut-sided, here's our spring male on the left. And on the right, here is our fall bird. And the fall birds that look like this tend to be juveniles. Um, spring males are awesome. You know, you see that right away, and it's like, oh, yeah, I got gotcha. you. This is uh, chestnut sided. Got that bright chestnut there on the sides, yellow cap, black on the face, boom, easy, got it. But look how drastically different it is in the fall. Check out this. Here's a first spring female. So this is our, our female in the spring. She's still got the yellow cap. She's got the chestnut on the side, just washed out. That's still pretty easy. Here's our first fall male. Now, this guy looks significantly different than what he's going to look like when he grows up. Black on the face is completely non-existent. The yellow cap, instead of yellow, it's a greenish olive green color. Um, and the chestnut on the sides is very limited. Um, sometimes it's not even there at all. Sometimes it's a little more bold as in this species. And our first fall females, chestnut sided warblers, there's no chestnut on the sides. There's no black on the face. There's no yellow on the head. It is a olive green and gray bird. Now, the pattern of the olive green and the gray is pretty distinctive. There's not much else in the bird world that looks like this. Um, but it sure as heck looks a lot different 
than our breeding male chestnut-sided warbler. Our yellow rumps. Yellow rumps peak period of passage, we're looking at those mid-September through October. And then what's unique about those is that a lot of them will overwinter. And we can see yellow rumps all winter long in Ohio. Um, where you are, I, I don't know. But here in, in the Buckeye State, we can get yellow rumps all year long. And in the spring, they're looking like this. You know, we've got our, our nice brightly colored uh, males. We've got some females that are a little bit duller, a little bit more washed out. But in the winter, and this goes for the fall too, once they've molted, the yellow rump warblers look really different. They have a lot more brown, a lot less black and white. They may retain a tinge of yellow right on the, if you look at the picture on the right, right below that wing on the side of the breast. They may retain a tinge of yellow. And they always retain the yellow rump. But, you know, if the bird is sitting at a certain angle or certain direction or has its wings held the right way, you don't always see that yellow rump. Um, so this is our, our winter yellow rump warblers. Here are two that are really dull. Uh, top left, this, this yellow rump warbler is super, super dull. And the bottom right is much more brown, has some more of the side streaking, but still otherwise pretty dull. Um, you know, one more clue about this yellow rump is the facial pattern. Check out the facial pattern, especially look, look up here on the top right at this female. And then let me click through to the facial pattern of the one on the top left. It still has a very similar facial pattern. Colors washed out, colors are a lot different. Um, but the pattern is very similar. There's a cheek patch with a little bit, little bit of an eyebrow and a white throat. And you look here, cheek patch, a little bit of an eyebrow. Not a white throat, but an off-white throat. You know, it's a similar pattern. So patterns are real important. Magnolia warbler in the male in the spring. Striking necklace that streaks down into the breast and through the belly. Uh, nice big white patch on the wings. Black and yellow on the face. When they come through late August and September, they're much more washed out. They have a little bit of olive on the back, which is similar to the perula, um, but don't get them confused. The perula might have a little bit more yellow on the throat. And the perula's yellow washes out towards the belly, whereas the magnolia warbler's yellow extends all the way back to the, to the belly, back into the flanks. Here's some magnolia warblers in the fall. Picture on the top left. He's much more muted. The face is completely different. The necklace is gone. Some streaking on the flanks, though. A full eye ring, and you see a little bit of olive on the back. The picture on the right with the hand, check out the tail. This can be a good clue for the magnolia warbler. Is those two white spots in the tail on either side of the middle. Um, if you see this bird flying away, it'll, it'll flash that tail pattern, which can be a good clue. And then the bottom picture is, is another variation. So, you know, as if it's, it's not hard enough to ID these things, often um, the, there's variation even between and among the individuals. Um, but that's, you know, that's nature, that's life. Things, things look differently as individuals. The bay-breasted warbler, uh, we're looking at an early to mid-September passage. And um, these guys really change. Uh, here's our spring male on the left. Real easy to tell. Um, that that uh, rusty brown chestnut color with the black face. And on the right, um, lots, it's, this thing's a lot different. Um, kind of goes to green. Check out these fall birds for bay breasted. Olive green head. What happened to all that rusty brown? Sometimes they'll retain a little bit of it on the sides. Check out the picture in the lower right, right below the wing. There's a little bit of rusty brown on the side. So sometimes they'll retain that. Um, and that's one of those things. It's, it's a variation among individuals. Some individuals, it'll be more bold. Some individu individuals, it may be almost completely gone. Bay breasteds. I'm going to go back to this picture, tend to have a little bit of striping on the back in the fall. 
So look back and forth between the right and left pictures. This fall bird on the right, a little bit of streaking on the back, just like the spring bird has a little bit of streaking. Still retains two wing bars. Here again, two wing bars, a little bit of streaking on the back, but otherwise it looks very different. Now before I move on to the next species, I want you to look at the feet of the bay-breasted. The feet of the bay-breasted is going to help you with determining this one from the next, because these are two notorious, notoriously difficult birds to distinguish. The black pole warbler. Black pole male, lower left, black pole coming through in the fall here on the right. Um, drastically different, except for maybe the wing bars. It's a really different looking bird. Black poles will come through a little bit later in September and early October. Now, if you just look at the, the black pole warbler, look at his body. Don't look at the feet. Just look at his body. I know that's hard to do. I just said don't look at the feet. But look at his body, and then I'm going to go back to bay breasted and check out that bay breasted's body. I mean, you can imagine. I mean, it's different seeing them here on pictures. But if you're in the field, these things are flying around. Here you go, oh, there's a little olive green bird with some gray on it and two wing bars. Oh, there's a little olive green bird with some gray on it and two wing bars. You know, it's flying from branch to branch. You're going to have to really watch these things to tell the difference. You know, and you might even see some streaking on the back. There's streaking on the back of the, of the black pole, just like there is the bay rested. But really, really try to get a look at this bird's feet because the Black pole has orange feet, and the bay breasted has gray feet. Check out the orange feet of the black pole, the gray feet of the bay breasted. Yeah, I, I know it's kind of tough probably to, to see these all the time. But here's what I believe. I believe that if you are a birder who's active and out, and you're out in late summer and early fall, and you're looking for these things, Eventually, you're going to get to a point where you may be able to identify these species without ever seeing the feet. Um, or you, you learn techniques for getting closer or getting better looks. Um, but experience is what really, really helps um, much more than, than um, you know, listening to lectures, even though I realize I'm giving a lecture. But experience is, is the real key to learning birds. Um, and it's good to know the little, little clues, little tips like looking at the feet. So here's two crappy views. Check out this. Crappy views of black pole warblers, but I can see the feet. Look at the top left. I can see those toes hanging over there. And the top or the bottom right, I can see his back toe, and I can tell that's yellow. So I'm looking at these, or sorry, orange. I'm looking at these birds, and I'm thinking, okay, I see wing bars. I see olive gray. It's shaped kind of like one of those black poles or one of those bay breasteds. I don't know which one until I catch those toes. Oh yeah, I gotta look at the toes. There they are. Oh, they're orange. So that's a black pole warbler. Um, so that's, that's it. Those are the tough ones. Let me just run back through these tough ones briefly one more time here. There are five chestnut-sided. Look for an olive green bird. A gray belly. That olive green on the chestnut side, it's kind of a bright olive green too on the head and back. Our yellow rumps, washed out gray, still retaining yellow rump. Practice these in the winter. They're around in the winter and listen for their chip note. They have a very dry chip note that they give when they're flying. Look for these around poison ivy berries. They love poison ivy berries. Uh, look for uh, yellow rumped warblers. Learn those in the winter. Magnolia warblers, um, sort of a, a yellow belly that extends all the way back, all the way back near he, his his um, lower end, like behind his tail on the flanks, two spots on the tail. The bay breasted, a little tinge of brownish there on the sides. Um, black feet, black pole. No tinge of brown on the on the black pole, and you may you may even say and and you know it looks like the black pole from the pictures that I have tends to have a little bit more of an olivey yellow color in general, um, but don't forget there's individual variation, but they'll always have orange feet for black pole warblers.
So that wraps up my talk. Um, take a few minutes if we have any questions, and I'd like to thank you all for uh, listening, and I hope that you got something good out of this. Um, hopefully it was helpful to you in, in some little ways, maybe encourages you to go outside and look for some fall warblers. I think they're really fun, um, really enjoy looking for those myself. Um, so if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take those. Great. Thank you so much, Scott. Yes, please uh, go ahead and enter those questions in the chat box. And I just wanted to, to thank you again for your presentation, all those great tips. And I think the biggest takeaway for me is if, if you want to be a better birder, go out and bird more. <laughs> so I'm going to take that as a charge to do some birding this weekend. But um, our first question is, um, does learning where the birds can be found, treetops, et cetera, in spring help to find them also and ID them in the fall? So um, you mentioned this briefly about um, learning the habitats of where you find those birds, but how much does that relate from the spring to the fall? It's it's really um, very similar. They retain a lot of the same habits. Um, migration in general, sometimes they get really hungry and they may do some, some things they wouldn't normally do or turn up someplace they wouldn't normally turn up. Um, but in general, birds that are... Um, you know, treetop dwellers in the spring, they'll be in treetops in the fall. Birds that are skulkers, like um, Connecticut's and mornings in the spring, they'll be, they'll be skulking in the fall. So in general, um, I'm going to say yes, it, it will help to learn those habits. Yeah. Great. Um, and, and Tina's wondering if we can get a copy of your slides. Um, as I mentioned before, the, the recording of the presentation will be available and posted on obcinet.org. But um, Scott, would you be willing to share a copy of the slides as well um, through our website? Sure, yeah. Okay, great. Well, I can work with you on that. And then I'm going to okay. put in the chat here um, our website again just so everyone has it. Okay, and um, I think, again, the, the fact that you're pointing us to look at patterns in addition to looking at colors is, is so important. That's always the first thing I know I look for is, is color in the spring, and then when you're just faced with a yellow bird or an olive bird in the in the fall, it can be somewhat uh, a little bit daunting. <laughs> yeah. But um, maybe Scott, um, if you would be willing to share um, for those of us that are here in um, Ohio and and maybe even particularly Central Ohio, do you have any um, hot spots um, for fall warblers um, that you really enjoy going to? Uh, that's um... That's kind of tough. It depends. Um, I grew up and, and I currently live sort of in eastern Ohio where we have a lot of woods. And um, the birds tend to spread out more. Um, right. In the, now in the metro parks in Columbus, any of the metro parks in Columbus can be good on any given day because the birds are funneled into those woody places and, and you tend to find a little bit more. So. I would say if you're in a city and you are near a city and you have a, a nice metro park, go there. Um, I spent a lot of time um, when I was in college in Mount Vernon on the Kokosing Gap Trail, and I saw a lot of fall warblers there. Um, one piece of advice that I may have is go to the same spot over and over again throughout the, the fall, and you'll, you'll pick them up. Um, they won't be there every day. And a lot of times with fall warblers, one of the, the interesting things is you might walk a mile and not see very many, and you'll think, geez, it's really a, a bad day for them. And then all of a sudden, there's all this activity, and there'll be so many birds, you can't hardly keep track of all of them. So they kind of come through in little clusters as well. So keep that in mind that, um, you know, if you, I think if you go to the same place, like for example, I live outside of Zanesville near Dillon Lake. Um, I bet if I would go to the state park and walk a path the state park at Dillon Lake, I would probably see a lot of fall warblers, but I'd have to go back you know, throughout the season. Okay. Well, thanks again, Scott. I'm getting a lot of um, positive feedback here that people enjoyed the presentation. I know I really did. Um, it's inspired me to, to go out and, and try to do what I can to ID some of these birds, so I do appreciate it. And um, thank you again, everyone, for joining us today, and I hope that you will come back and join us next month um, again for our webinar on um, passenger pigeons. And if you would like to sign up, to receive email notice notifications for each of our upcoming webinars, um, please visit the link that I posted on the chat window, obcinet.org, to sign up for that list. 
So thank you again, everyone, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and have a great weekend. And thanks, Scott. Thank you.